Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip, the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit MagnaGrip.com. Everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of exposure four. Got the fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Now remember giving the payday. A different account is for. Okay. 610B. That was the main date. 610B. I'm out here. We got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling. Fire shown from the second floor. Give me a second alarm on this. I think up to the top floor. I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building. Uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke. Go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. Got people on the front fire escape here with windows circuits below them. We need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame, heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor, second line being stretched, primary stretches are underway. Hey, welcome back to our fire engineering podcast, The Command Post. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my best buddy and teaching partner and partner in, well, I won't say partner in crime. We, we don't do that stuff. But anyway, um, Chief John Salka. And uh, we, we've we've gonna we're gonna throw another show at you today, another topic uh, that we just that we just decided on about two minutes ago uh, with our producer Mark. But so, John, I always I always start off. I always ask you about family, but I, I got to ask you about something that you absolutely love as much as your kids and grandkids. How much snow did you get, buddy? Um, how much you, how much did you get yesterday? We we got a bunch. We got a bunch of snow. It's uh. It's up, more than a couple of places. It was over a foot, over a foot thick, you know, high, deep. Um, yeah, a lot of snow. It's great. The whole place looks great. The woods are covered. Everything is everything is white as far as I can see, which is wonderful. And I know there, you know, some people are like, oh, it's gonna snow. Oh, God, I get my stuff out. And you're like, you're like staring out the window, waiting for Santa Claus to come, like looking for the snow to come down. I mean, it is a little bit of work because I got the big long driveway <laughs> and the ramp and the front deck and all the other stuff to shovel and clean up. But you know what? Between my little machine with the plow on it and Brian is here, he's helping too. So it's not it's not a lot of work. And uh, and once you shovel, you know what? A snowstorm, you shovel pretty much once, maybe twice if it's long, and then you're done. And then the beautiful snow is there for uh, weeks or however long it lasts. And We'll see. Well, and for our viewers, because we were, we were we were laughing with Mark, our producer, about this before we went live. Um, uh, so for those of you out there that are picturing John all bundled up with a parka and gloves and snow all in his mustache and all that, no, no don't don't let him shit you. I'm, I'm, you know, so he gets in his heated, air conditioned, uh, big gigantic seat plow with his cup of hot cocoa and. He actually gets so warm in there, he has to take a jacket off. He's got his yep. music yep. playing. It's all true. And he has to all plow true. his 7,000-foot uh, driveway up into the Salka compound. So don't, don't, don't. <laughs> and it's got to be nice having, having, I mean, I know, you know, Brian's there for a little bit, but uh, uh, they're going to be uh, changing location soon. But to have, you know, I, I know you love all five of your kids, but when you get, you know, having your helper, you know, you're Brian yeah, there with great. you. It's great. Uh, I'll tell you what, though, having that side by side, that Polaris machine that I got, I'll tell you what, that is by far some of the best money I ever spent as far as being helpful to me around the house. You know, I use that in the summertime. I use it to drag out the garbage cans once a week, you know, because my garbage gets put out, you know, pretty far away from my house and used to throw the stuff in the back of the truck, you know. <clears throat> but uh, that side by side, man, it plows. I used to have a regular little quad that you sit on, you know, and uh, it had a plow. It was manual, you know. You'd pull it back and put it back down. And but you're still out in the weather. You're still out in the cold weather and the snow. This thing, like you said, I'm inside the compartment. It's got a steering <laughs> wheel. It's got the heat. I paid extra to have heat put in this thing, so I stay nice and warm when I'm in there. It ain't bad at all. And I do my neighbors' driveways and everything else too. So. Yeah, yeah, you just up and down. You do the street for the county, and no, you know. no, no, no. All I do is my <laughs> driveway and my and my neighbor's driveway. Yep. Well, and speaking of, I mean, you know, uh, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're. I always brag. I, your your kids are my kids, and my kids are your kids. I always brag about how successful your your kid kiddos are with you and Dawn. Um, but so, and I'll just say this: How cool is it having Brian? on your volunteer department, making runs with them. And, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, we, you and I talk to people all the time, like, 
you know, hey, how's your, oh, my kid got on the job. Or they're in class, father, son, or, you know, mother, daughter kind of thing. You see them there with their with their kids. You know, I you talk about sometimes and you're beaming when you talk about, yeah, Brian's doing drill tonight or he's doing this or whatever. How cool is that? You know, it is cool. And 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 you're right. The thing you just mentioned, the fact that he's he just jumps in there, man, on drill night like tonight. He'll be down there tonight. Uh, they're getting ready to head back down to South Carolina for that first little short trip that they have to go down and do a couple of things. But um, he's there every Wednesday night. He takes runs in, you know, midnight, one o'clock in the morning, a run comes in. If I don't get down quick, downstairs quick, out to the garage, boom, he's gone. He drives away. You know, if I get there, he'll wait for me and let me jump in a car with him. But if I'm not down there, he's out of here. So, uh, but he runs the drills. He's so sharp. You know, he's been paying attention to what he's doing the last couple of years and in those couple of good fire departments he was in. And, uh, yeah, he's having fun. He loves it. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Well, um, oh, oh, actually, before we uh, – you and I are, are – uh, are going to uh, we actually just finished um in in uh eddie county new mexico um mm-hmm. right before this show um we're going to be out there with a great it's a good mix uh, about half uh, career guys half volunteer uh some some great men and women out there uh reminder to our viewers uh fdic is right around the corner april man uh john and i have our workshop on day one uh on monday uh you asked for it you got it five alarm leadership is back um, but don't wait. There's only so many seats. And that's what used to happen with this particular program before is, you know, people like I try to get in, they close the doors because, you know, we follow codes too, just like everybody else. And there's only so many seats. So make sure you get pre-registered for that. And then the three degrees of A-Day right after opening ceremonies on Wednesday, we'll be doing that program. And we'll be, and you know, what? We've, been, we've been doing that one for a while and it's just, it's popular. We fill a classroom up. A lot of people show up. So we, so we keep doing it, you know? Oh, it, it, last year it was packed. Remember, they were sitting on the sides and uh, they closed the doors. Um, but uh, so if we're not doing that, we're been, we're in the book booth signing signing books. Come come, heck, if you're not, if you even if you have a book, come by. You know, we love taking pictures, and 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 it's always an honor. It's always an honor for us to 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 talk with the the greatest people on the face of the earth, our firefighters. So come see us. If we're not there, we'll be in the Columbia Southern booth, or we'll be in the Dingus Fire. Our good friends from Dingus Fire. Uh, Nick Dingus and, and uh, uh, Jeff Bryant, uh, uh, my, my good friend and brother, um, another great volunteer fire department. If you want to see how it's done, uh, Amboy Volunteer Fire Department in Illinois is incredible. But So come see us. Um, so that's the FDIC uh, reminder. And John. And one, more, one more new piece <laughs> of news, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just a little... It's just a little thing going on in the life of, of Jamie and Rick Lasky, my wife and I. Um, uh, I'll just, you know, a lot of you saw it on social media. Um, John, I, I am so excited. Well, you and I talk, you know, we talk like a couple little kids. We're on the phone sometimes three and four or five times a day for an hour, hour and a half, you know, um, just talking. I'm, I'm, I told you the other day, John, on the phone, it's like we're going, what are you wearing? What are you doing? What did you have for lunch <laughs> and all that? And uh, all those different things. Um, you know, I've been talking about this, um, the excitement. Uh, I am out of my mind excited about this opportunity. Um, I've been offered and accepted the position of fire chief with the Estes Valley uh, Fire Protection District and Estes. Well, they, they cover the town of Estes Park, Colorado, and then the valley there. Oh, my God. Um, John. And I've wore you out with it. What what, a, what what an incredible organization! First of all, what a great community. Um, I was there last February, and I you know I got in late, you know, so I didn't get to see anything outside. And then I taught right there where I was staying, so I didn't get to see anything. So it really wasn't about the Rocky Mountain and, and the breathtaking views and as beautiful as the place is. Is I fell in love with the fire department, the members uh, during break. Um, uh, you know, just. It was great. I told my wife when I got to my hotel room, I said, we need to move here. And she says, really? I said, oh, if, if you know, and I, I, you know, I was kind of serious, half joy. So this, this job ever opens up and um, lo and behold, it did. And um, uh, had some buddies call me and go, oh, you need to go. You need to try. And the whole process was done extremely professional, John. I told you about this. Um, Absolutely. Uh, the, what nice, sounds like a nice group of people there too. Oh, 
the the search firm that that they hire, you know, you and I do a lot of recruiting for a lot of people. Um, you know, we help them. Sadly, we help them get rid of bad chiefs, and we we help them find uh, good chiefs. You know that kind of thing. Um, but um, uh, the 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 search firm was was incredible. Um, the process, uh, you know, they flew us out there along with a couple other candidates. Uh, the tour uh, by John and Paul, the two big chiefs there. Uh, I, I could I could take a whole show and brag about our staff. Uh, the the staff there is the, it's the dream team. Uh, I, you know, I had it with Tim and Daryl. You remember that Tim and Daryl and, and Melissa and Charlene in Louisville and with Jamie uh, McDaniels and, and, and Kenny Gabriel at Coeur d'Alene. But this is, the, this is look up the definition of dream team. You'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, the tour, the, the, the evening meet and group, John, I mean, there was like a hundred some people. I mean, the place was packed. The interviews the next day was like, you know, three different sets of interviews and they, Look, they they threw everything at you. There, this was not just a. So, what do you have to offer? It was it was a great process. Um, I was honored they offered us the the, the position, and uh, uh, before we left, actually, and you know, house is sold. I can't wait to get there. I wish I was there like six months ago. I can't wait to get there and uh, yep. hit the ground it's gonna running. Going to be great. Going to be great. So for our viewers, you're going to be looking on the website for the Estes Valley Fire Protection District. Um, if you can't show a little love, go to their Facebook page, their Twitter page, um, you know, and make sure you, you you like and follow the Estes Estes Valley you know Fire Protection District their their Facebook page. They have a great regional training uh, academy that they do a ton of classes. Polly takes you know, oversees that. Um, and instructors come from all over the country for different programs and. Um, all kinds of different stuff. So anyway, I, like I said, I could, I could talk about that all day long, but I'm not going to. So, um, Hey, um, let's get to our topic. You and I, uh, were talking about this one the other day and, uh, this morning when we, we got with Mark and we're like, okay, uh, right before we went live, um, you know, we love talking leadership. We love talking development. We love talking tactics and strategy. We love talking safety or survival, all the different topics at brass position, all that stuff. How about we we spend this session talking about the out the outside the outside vent man the outside vent position OVM OVP whatever you call it but but um, and I've always said John I, I think it's a position that is often overlooked by so many incident commanders uh, it's such a huge benefit it's one of those you talk about like rescue two being an impact company I talk about Wichita West. Uh, my volunteer fire department where I'm at now being an impact fire department, we show up, good things happen. Let's talk about the impact of the outside bed position, John, because for, I've seen that. I've You know, we talk about making and breaking it. One person can be all the difference in the world between that initial successful fire attack. And so many people forget about, they, they don't even practice, practice the position. They don't assign some of the position or it's kind of accidental. But but I know in Louisville, I know in the FDNY and in and, 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 uh, you know South Bloomington Gold, the OV is just a huge, huge, huge thing going on the fire ground, is it not? Absolutely, and uh, you know it's it's a unique position. It's it's not a big drain on staffing. Obviously, like you said, one person. I mean, I mean, I think it's designed. I think it's designed for two people for a team. You know, they, they can do it better. But one firefighter, a single firefighter, can ad- adequately and absolutely be the outside vent guy at a, at a job, at a house fire, or even a small apartment, or a motel, or a hotel, or you know, residential kind of a building. Um, and what's great about it is it's it's a you know it, it's people entering the building to areas you know that that could be harboring life, right? Like areas that where people could be. Um, and they, they get in very quickly because you're jumping in from the outside. You don't have to go through the front door and go up the stairs and go left and go right and find a door. Is it swinging in? Is it swinging out? None of those things apply. You pick a window. Now, obviously, picking a window is, is as important. You know, you, you don't pick the small window with the frosted glass or the or the or the window that looks like the kitchen window. So, but you you pick a window or a set of windows, and you know, and either in you go from the first floor, from the from the yard, from the side yard. Or and you go from a portable ladder, or off a fire escape, or off the roof of a garage, or however you get access to the windows. You pick a window, you vent it, you open it up, 
and then you go and you and you search that area and you and you, you know and there's a process there's a specific process there's some things you really I don't I don't want to say that you have to do because you know obviously outside vent is just like lots of other things in the fire service there's different ways to do things some people you take all the steps some people shorten it some people do something a little bit different than everybody else we've learned that with hose line stretching and everything else you know but uh, anyway so yeah, it's, it's a great position, and, and I think historically, if you looked at the numbers, I think it generates a lot of rescues. I think the outside vent position is the person in a lot of fire departments that, that, that I don't want to say stumbles because this is by design. This is a planned search, right? They're, they're the ones that, that come up with a lot of grabs. They're the ones that, that save a lot of lives at, at house fires and other residential uh, occupancies. Well, and, and, and like I said, I, I, you know, you've heard me say in a class plenty of times where we're, we're doing tactics and strategy and t- or talking about organizing the fire round, that, that OV, that one part, because some, I've had people in the past, John, that don't understand and say, well, you know, you can't send somebody around the fire round by themselves as freelance. And I go, no, no, freelancing means they're doing something that you don't know about as command. But this is a, this is a trained, SOG'd, described task position that they have a set of tasks and I used to use, uh, I'll, I'll pick on Gary Apple again, you know, Gary's captain, driver, when he was a firefighter, when he was the OV, you know, in Louisville, you pull up, if they say smoke showing, fire, whatever, two things are going to happen. Um, and you better be quick if you don't want them done. One is the, the roof's going to get a hole in it. If you if, if you knock the fire real quick, you better be yelling, no, 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 no. And remember, we talk about guys are looking down from the roof going, really? You, you, SOP, we are, ready, we are ready to cut the hole. Same thing with the OV. They get off the – there's no assignment. It's no, okay, uh, firefighter, Salka, uh, be the OV. They get off the rig. They On the way there, they're going, I know I'm the OV. I'm the outside vent person on this call. And the moment they get – they're thinking, where am I going? On the way to call, they're thinking, okay, with the neighborhood, the houses, where I'm going, you know, accessibility, blah, 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 all that different stuff, one story, two story, all that different. And that's another ahead, important point that you just brought up, the fact that – um and again, I'm not mandating anybody, you know, to, to policies on, on assigning personnel assignments. But if, if having it assigned already, having the outside vent as an assigned position for the shift for the day or for the run in a volunteer fire department, right? Tommy, you get the OV. Having that assigned, the, the guy or the gal, the firefighter can be thinking about it on the way to the, to the run. They can be thinking about it. Yeah, we're going to a house on Maple Avenue. Yep, that's all houses down there. All right, good. And the guy might even know Maple Avenue. That's all those. Uh, Ranch style homes, or that those one and a half story peak roof private dwellings, or whatever it is, and you can start to plan on it rather than arriving at the scene, getting off the rig, having your mask on, getting your tools, and you know, you, the officer says, "Okay, uh, uh, Billy, uh, you do you you take the OV." Now all of a sudden, it's sort of thrust on you, and you sort of it's sort of short notice, if you know what I mean. So you know, having assignments is great. That's what one of the great things about predetermined assignments for people riding. Uh, a rig, whether you get it when you're getting on the rig in a volunteer firehouse or whether you get it at the beginning of a shift in a career department, all day long, every run you go on, you're the OV or you're the roof firefighter or you're the guy in the irons or you're the driver or whatever job it is you have. And and I and I understand a lot of places have maybe just three guys on the rig and, you know, one's driving, one's the offset, and there's one guy in the back by himself. But still, it's nice to have a plan. It's nice to have, know what tools you're going to pick and what job you're going to be doing. Well, and if you can do that, like I said, and sometimes if you don't have that pre-assigned, you only have the three guys in rig and you're second or third do or whatever you can do, that's the officer, right? Turn around going, hey, Rick, you got the OV on this. I mean, I'm, I'm a big one, turn around, because, you know, a lot of our volunteer departments, we don't know who's, you know, jumping in behind us. One of the things I loved, or one of the many things I loved about, uh, you know, SS Valley is the fact that you can go to their website, you can see each seat, and if you're riding that seat, what you do. But, you know, we, we talk about organizing the fire ground in our, our workshop and in our, you know, the class we've done with Dan, our shows. Sometimes it's just leaning back saying, oh, you got the roof, you got this. Hey, we're going to have the primary search or whatever, or we're going to be writ. Same thing you know, outside vent. There's so many thoughts going through your head on the way there. So when they pull up, and I guess, John, let's let's break this down step by step. So we, we, we make the corner, we pull up, you tell me. You know, Rick, you're, you're the OV, or I know I'm the OV ahead of time. I get off the rig. I know what I like my OV to carry, okay, for tools. Obviously, you know, they're going to be, we know this, they'll be fully decked out, you know, their turnout gear, 
SCBA in their back. <clears throat> you know, I've always been a big believer. I want them to carry a Halligan, a Halligan tool, you know, fourth century, fourth century tool. Depending on the size, I always said you can always tell in Louisville who the OV is because instead of just a six foot all purpose hook or Halligan hook, I actually encouraged them to carry the, the you know, to make, to bring an eight footer. And the only reason was sometimes a window, sometimes some reach, you can short handle it. You can, you can, you know, you can kill off two feet off the end of that if you need to. I love the six foot hook, but I always show that picture like you see the five guys for the Tower on Louisville, and I go, who's the OV? And you see them all with their tools. There he is there because he's got the irons. He's got he's the one standing with the eight foot, you know, Halgan hook or roof hook, you know, all parts. Right. Just so you, it gives you two more feet of reach for what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, I, I've told some guys if you know you've got a two story, sometimes it's easy to drag. You know, good. You know, you got a straight ladder, something back there. So you get back there. Last thing we do is go. Oh man, you know, I wish I'd get up that second floor window. Let me run back and get a ladder. But at a minimum, I think you need a set of irons and you need that hook. Um, so let's talk as they're taking off, John, the outside bed per, 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 person, this position, you know, tell me, let, let's talk tasks and size up as they're heading to the back. We've always talked about this before you even get to the back of the building. There's things you're looking for and there's things you're looking that you can actually do on the way. And I think one of the I'll, I'll throw the first one out there is, <clears throat> is is utilities. I've said this before. If one of my, if you're doing a, if you're doing 360 or the OV and you're walking at a, at a fire, at a fire, and you're walking by a gas meter, and I always say, how many turns does it take to shut up a gas meter? Everybody goes a quarter. You know, it takes you what a matter of five seconds. To, it, it, we're going to shut it off anyway. You're walking past. It's not. You're not delaying nothing. You stop. You you take your fork. You turn and you keep going. If now, if you got to climb through stuff and break, I, I understand that. But if you're going to walk right by it, you know, I, I'm just like just just a quarter turn and keep going, man. So let's talk about what they're seeing before they even vent the building, John. You're you. you what are you expecting them to be observing as they're walking that building as the OV to help? You're standing in front as the incident commander, Rick. You're the OV. What are they, what are they looking for? Well, obviously, you got to try and try. And I always say that it's one of the things you really don't know for sure. Even with visible fire, sometimes it's hard to tell where the exact uh, location of the fire is. But you want to obviously you can maybe figure out first floor, second floor. You know, it's, it's in it's in that corner. You know, to the left, the one two corner or the A B corner. Um, once you figure out where the fire is, then you know, like, and I always used to love you know going to the floor above, right? So you get a first floor fire in a two story house or a two and a half story house. You got all them second floor windows now to pick, right? Obviously, you want to try and get to the ones immediately over the fire well, if you can. And John, real quick, you said it. How and 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 I didn't want to pass up because you made a great point about fire location. How many times <clears throat> you've been standing outside as the IC? You know, you do your three six, you come back, and the OV gets it back. Says, "Hey, chief, you know, every all indications from you is fires on the first floor. They get to the back and they got fire on the window on the second floor. Right. Now, I didn't want to pick because that was a great point you made about." Fire, fire location, because sometimes that simple thing of, you know, command from OV, hey, hey, boss, I'm seeing fire out the second floor window here. And you're like, oh, okay, I didn't have that when I did my 360 or whatever. Right. I didn't. That was a great point you made, but keep going. And I'm, and I'm not saying you got to do a 360, because obviously if that's already been done by the first arriving officer or whoever did it, uh, the outside vent position doesn't have to redo that again. But you should – your eyes should be open. You should be scanning the side. Obviously, you're looking at the front of the building. You choose one side or the other to start walking around to get to the rear. Um, maybe you choose that side because that's where the utilities are and you want to you want to grab the gas on the way around. Or maybe you choose the other way because you see a little bit more smoke showing on that side. So you look you're probably gonna get a look at three sides of the building on the way on the way to the rear of the building. And you're probably gonna be the first set of eyes on the rear of the building. Well, you know, if a house is on fire or a building's on fire, and 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 that's when you're gonna decide where you're gonna go. Again. Dragging that ladder around with you is not a bad idea because if if you know from the front that it's a first floor fire and you're going to probably be jumping into the second floor windows, what are you going to be surprised by something? What are you, gonna, you know, and you would be surprised if there was a setback in the rear or a garage or what about whatever. a walkout, John? What about a walk? You get to the back and now you have a, a exposed lower level and you're looking, going, "Well, I really want to vent that window on the first floor." You now know, you're out so of range. Ladder, you know? So if you drag yeah. a ladder back there with you, a nice, a nice ladder back there with you, you can throw it up. 
that there's your ticket into the building, right? And you talked earlier about the tools. Uh, FDMY, they generally carry a, a hook, a metal, a metal hook, and, and just a halligan. No axe. They're not, they're not going to carry three tools. Um, so there you go. You're able to do that. And and even if you're by yourself, there's your opportunity. You can always use the uh, can always use the halligan into the snow or into the dirt or into the mud, into the mulch to butt that ladder if you're by yourself, if you don't have somebody holding that ladder. So you can you can put the, the butt of the ladder down. You can use that halligan at the bottom to hold it. And now you climb up with your hook. You can vent your window. And a lot of guys don't talk about that. That's another great point. A lot of guys never talk about that. They never have that idea, John, to stick that halligan in it about the ladder for you. So gr- that's another great point you make. Sorry to interrupt yes. you, but that was yes. awesome. Yep. <clears throat> so, 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 so keep going. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to ask you what you want to continue talking about. You know, well, taking a window. So, and- yeah. Well, before we take the window, we come around the back, like you said, and we're looking. We're, you know, I mean, one of the things that you've heard me talk about when Curtis and I, uh, Curtis Bird from Pearland, uh, Jay's Jay's ops chief, uh, our our good buddy, um, years ago when I was, we were in, uh, oh god, it was the nineties, early nineties. We we're in uh, Brooklyn riding out. You know, and and uh, remember, I was riding with uh, your firefighter off a of squad, off a of squad one, uh, Johnny Squad, John Cullen. Yep, with Lieutenant two thirty five engine, and, and and Curtis was riding with the squad, and and I talked about every video I shot, every firefighter that got off an FDOI rig looked up. I never saw anybody with their head down. They got off. All of them were like this and looking up. So you know I, that that's one of the points I make is as the OV, you're you're my eyes and ears as you're walking. Don't be just I got to get to the back. Be looking up. You know that's that view you see this like this, John. The head's cocked. They're looking at the side of the building. They're coming around that backside. And on the way back to we talk about utilities, you know, looking for we're, we're looking for down power lines that they burn through off the off the drip lines, off, you know, and, and they're laying on the ground. Everything from dogs to, to potential victims. I remember remember in Coeur d'Alene during our one mayday, right before the mayday, my my chief I had to back a building, you know, gave me a shout on a radius. I have a handprint. I have a handprint on a second floor window in the soot. A handprint, and we had a guy down. You know, so that being said, there, um, you're coming around the back. And we've talked about before. You see a whole bunch of toys. I want to know that. You see, you always say it. You see a rose garden, a religious statue, and a Cadillac in a driveway. How about this one? Well, Built-in swimming pools, which are hazards to firefighters. Walkout basements, fire conditions. This one, we always, I always say, what else might you see? And once in a while, someone will say, and you and I both can't. What about, what about a wheelchair ramp? You know. It's, I've seen guys walk past those and not even mention the command. Hey, command from OV, chief. I've got I've got a handicap. I've got a wheelchair ramp, which is telling me I've got someone inside that's maybe medically challenged or or you know that can't walk. That that if I'm and, searching and a ramp, for you, that and a ramp doesn't even necessarily mean a wheelchair. It just could be you know what I got senior citizens here. They're not going up and down yeah. the stairs anymore. So it's still somebody that needs a little bit extra help, maybe right. Someone that maybe couldn't have got themselves out because they don't walk like you and I. So, but a lot of guys miss that. So, seeing all that, cars in the driveway, things, exposures, um, fire out of, out a of window, and you're going, "Command, I got fire." Because, like I said, you may have done your 360s a chief and not had fire out the back. Now it, it pushes through a window, and you have an exposure problem. That I, I can't emphasize the eyes and ears of that OV for command is huge. Um, if you have nothing to say, don't type the radio, but if there's some key things, so, and there's probably more, you and I've done it before in our 360 class at our shows, there's more we could talk about visibility wise, but we're the OV coming back there. So I want you to talk about, and we, we cover this in class when you met, you kind of mentioned before window selection. The first thing I want to do, I want my OV to do, I'll cut to this one is force the back door, get to the back door, force it, or give the, the interior crew a second means of egress. I'm giving a second means of egress. I'm popping that door. Maybe there's someone there. Maybe people go out their back door a lot, you know, to the backyard for the dog or the car. That I can wedge it open. I don't want it to close. I want to, you know, I'm going to control it, but I'm giving an exhaust opening for the first crew. This might be the first vent that we've done to any part of that building. Pop the door. Most residential doors are not that big a deal. You can reach in and sweep with your hook, you know, make sure you roll, you know, or hook it with your foot, whatever, and, you know, however you got to do it. But talk window selection, John. You you mentioned it before because you mentioned something. I always say you always do this. You throw little tidbits out there and go, oh, that's another key point. The frosted versus non, you know, if I'm going to take a window, which one? Tell me what you're thinking windows back there. 
the windows are interesting. You know, the windows are the, they're sort of like the hint. They're sort of like the map of the rooms inside. And, and if you're educated, if you, if you pay attention, I don't want to say the building construction, but if you pay attention to buildings and what they look like and what the windows look like, um, you can, you can not almost always, but very often, you can very often predict what room those windows serve. Meaning, am I going to jump on that window or not? Obviously, we know the small window on the first floor, somewhere near the back door, is probably the kitchen window, right? Uh, m- maybe small, but not frosted over. Then you see those smaller windows, first floor, second floor. They get the frosted glass. We we know that's going to be that's going to be a bathroom. Again, or, a place you're probably a, not going to Or a shade, or a shade like you have in your yeah, house yeah, for yeah, me. Right. Right. Um, and, and, you know, some houses have single windows, you know, double hungs, but single ones. And some places like my home, every window, every place that I got a window, it's two windows together. It's a double window. You know, those serve a lot of different kinds of rooms. They serve dining rooms, they serve living rooms, and they serve bedrooms. When you're looking at the second floor of, let's say, an ordinary house, a residential building, many of the windows on the second floor are bedrooms. Uh, we talked about the town home that you're looking at in, in, in Colorado. Um, we've both been in a million different kinds of buildings, right? And often, even a three-bedroom place with a couple of bathrooms, you're going to have mostly bedrooms on the second floor, two bedrooms and a bathroom, and all the other rooms are on the first floor. So once you start going to the second floor, just from from a from a perspective of the chances of what rooms are up there, you have a greater chance of getting into a bedroom, number one. Number two, if you, if you pick the proper windows, uh, you know, obviously big bay windows, you're going looking at the front door of a house, a bay window to the right, you know, that's probably the living room. And and maybe behind that is the dining room. Kitchens are generally in the rear. Not absolutely, but generally in the rear. So don't just pick any old window. You should p- pick a window with a plan. And obviously, the fire location is important, too. You want to get as close to the fire. If the fire's on the first floor, you want to try as, as, as much as you can. You want to try and get above that fire. You want to try and be as close to the room right above the fire as possible because that's the most severely exposed area. So take it. So taking it, you know, if it's not already vented, and you've got a pretty good idea, you're looking. I know some of these, John. Uh, nowadays, they can't, they have a they for, hanging from their SCBA. They got a tick, a thermal imager, and they get around back and they go window, window. Oh, 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 right here. Especially now here's the other thing too. You're in front and you're going, you know, interior division one from command. Have you guys got water cheap? We're still trying to find the fire, and then you get an OV that comes to the back and it says. Chief, the 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 BC the BC bedroom. I've got high heat on a window here. I'm you know, and you don't you don't want to take it right because we have to talk about we'll talk about the coordination between that and the hand line. You know, make sure the hand line's in there. But I, how many times you had guys inside trying to find the fire, and the OV gets back there and goes, oh, I, I know where it is. I'm looking at a window right now, or this one is you know hot. You know, I know the fire's in here. This one isn't. So right. that being said, but try you know. The coordination, I think, is huge too. I don't want to skip past that because, you know, we've always talked about you get their way to you. You you start popping windows in the back or something before they have a line in place. You know, I, I'm always listening. I'm always hearing. I'm like, okay, line. You know, a lot of times the line's going in as the OV, unless the truck gets there ahead of time, which that happens. You see the line going. It's charged. Okay, I got a pretty good idea. They're going to be inside pretty quick. I remember. I remember John. Uh, I was on an interior attack line in Summit. We went mutual aid. Bill Lester was my lieutenant. Jeff Clohesse was the outside vent person. And it was a chicago type bungalow. And we had a good fire. And I'm on the nozzle. And we get inside. And, and a lot of young firefighters have never experienced that, the pressure. When when you open a door and that's the only opening. And, and it's almost like sometimes someone's holding your shoulders down. And then all of a sudden, I, I, I'm, I'm listening. I can hear in the back. I can hear Jeffrey all the way to the back of the building. I can hear the glass break and smash, smash, smash. And it's like somebody released me and and everything everything reversed. And I was like, all of a sudden now, it was like push, 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 and, I, and, and we got it. So what that did for us um, was huge. But that coordinated attack you and I talk about all the time between the vent, you know, vertical, horizontal, whatever, you know, we're not just going back there and taking windows and hoping the hose line's on its way to the building, you know. You know, sometimes it takes some restraint to go, okay, I'm going to pop, I'm going to control the door, pop the door. If I have to, I can close it, you know, open it. I've given an exhaust opening, you know, a little bit of pressure relief. But if I'm there ahead of the engine crew at my truck, my ladder company, or 
they're not in yet, you know, that coordination is huge. I don't want to delay ventilation, but I want to make sure I'm pretty close. But you well, said it, getting as close as And that's an Go interesting ahead. point that you just brought up because um, outside vent, you know, most of the time when people are talking about being the outside vent, the OV or the fire or the residential fire or the house fire or whatever, they're talking about going somewhere, venting, getting in a room, making a search, completing that search, coming back out, maybe moving to another room or another window, going in again. But sometimes the outside vent is the guy around the back of the house waiting to waiting to get the word to take some windows because he's venting for fire because the engine's moving in and he's not even not even going to go in. Maybe maybe just going to vent right. the area for for the engine to move in and that's fine too. And a lot of small volunteer departments or even or even small career departments that don't have good staffing, a lot of times they'll send the guy around to the back. And for example, in volunteer departments, some of them have exterior people, right? People who who are not not. I don't want to say qualified, meaning they don't know enough what to do, but for whatever reason, maybe it's age, maybe it's fit test, maybe the guy wears a beard, whatever it is. There's a lot of reasons sometimes people are not interior qualified, right? And in a lot of volunteer fire departments, a a non-interior guy, an exterior firefighter can be sent around the rear of a house at a house fire, and he can do some selective venting for the engine company to, to, to move in without ever going inside the building, you know? So that frees up one person to get some good work done that that another interior guy could be now cut loose from doing that. And he, he could be the guy on the line or the guy going up, you know, to the second floor search from the interior or whatever. And that needs to be a topic for another one of our shows because you just mentioned it, the exterior firefighter, because it's another often overlooked invaluable position on the fire ground. Some people, some people go, Oh, our exterior firefighters are the, you know, they, they're the, they're the old guys that can't go anymore, whatever. That's not true. Right. That is not, that is the furthest thing. The value of the exterior firefighter is freaking incredible. And another, 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 another maker or make it or break it for your incident can be that exterior firefighter. So there's another role for them to be your outside vent person. Now, obviously they're not going to do vent and search because they're not going in, but the majority of the time, the OV really never does the vent and search sometimes. They go back there, they pop a window, pop a door, the interior crew is coming in. They do a couple of things. They're sizing up. They might reach in. If they took a bedroom window, you know, maybe a second window because they hear you in there and they reach in their cert, they're just, you know, they're not putting themselves in an ideal H atmosphere, but but at the same time, they're doing some incredible things. Right. We, we we need to do a show on the exterior firefighter because that is that is that is a very, 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 very much underrated, absolutely invaluable position on the fire ground. That the right. exterior firefighter right. is critical. Right. But but so looking at the windows. So we talk about trying to get as close to the fire as possible. Um, I, I love we talked about the ladder because what happens? You get to the back, you go, oh, God, I, I, you know. Right. Now you got to run back out. To, like you already said that. Now you got to run back out to the front and do it again. You know, another trip to the front, another trip to the back. You're wasting time and there's people in there waiting for you, theoretically, right? Well, and let's talk about our, our buddies in Wichita. If you were going to do vent, enter, and search, we talked about this, a six-foot Halligan hook. Remember, you called me. You were all excited about, you know, how they had their their hook, their Halligan hook like mounted to their on the fly section extension ladder. Yeah, you know, there's, that. There's some, there's, about, I don't know what it's called. Ahead. I don't know what it's called. It's a little piece <laughs> of hardware. I, I think the guy that designed it, invented it, whatever, and and sells it. I I think he's there in Wichita. And what it is is this is this little piece of hardware that you can. Uh, secure. You can you can uh, not you don't you screw into the hook, around. but but it grabs the hook. And what it does is it puts a little spot on the hook, a little. It puts a little place to rest like the a, fork. Like a, right, right. Puts a little place on the on a on the shaft of the metal hook for you to put the fork of the halogen. So n- now when you're holding the two shafts, if you release a little bit of tension, the halogen is not going to slide down, which often ha- which often happens, right? So. That, that was a great idea, and and I think they have them on a lot of their tools. I've seen I've seen them in a couple of other places as well. Um, so if you're not leaving that, if you're not leaving the halogen bar at the bottom to 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 butt the ladder, and you're going to take it up there with you, which if you can, of course you should. It's a great great tool um, to do that. But but getting back to the window now. So you climb. So you select your window. You had your ladder with you. You throw it up there. You set it. Of course, where should the window? You know, the ladder be in relation to the window, right under the sill. Not not even. Not even protruding a little bit over the sill. Anything you put over the sill becomes an encumbrance. It becomes something you got to climb over, right? So you put right. it, you tuck it right under the windowsill. You climb up. You vent that window. When I when I got to go through instructions on venting the window here, but you got to vent that window 
big time. You want to vent that window to give yourself plenty well, of room to get in and get out. Anytime you take a window, you should turn it into a door. Right. You know, I see these guys just punch, and you have all this glass. You know what? Take it, and then if you have a hook, boom, 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 clear it. You'll turn the window into a door. And that's another thing you got to practice. That's another thing you got to have experience doing is is swinging that tool, using that metal halligan hook or whatever tool you have, vetting the window while you're, while you're at the top of a portable ladder, right? Now, some guys want to go into the leg lock and stuff like that, and, of course, that, that's a very safe thing to do. It takes a little more time. If, you, if you're good at doing that, grabbing a, a quick leg lock, you got to be able to vent that window completely standing on a ladder that's, that's already extended and you're up at the top of it. So vent the window. We always say let it blow. Wait just a couple of seconds to, for, for it to lift. If it's going to light up, it'll light up right then, and you'll be able to decide what you're going to do after that. Anybody who's listening has probably experienced it themselves or seen it. It might light up for five seconds, and then the pressure's gone, and a lot of the gases have come out the window. And now maybe the mixture has changed inside a little bit. And now it's just hot and smoky again. And you, you can get in, right? So you know you're getting into a dangerous situation here, you're a dangerous atmosphere. But you're doing it knowingly, right? So you vent the window. You let it you let it vent real quick. You, you feel for the floor, especially if you're in the room right above the fire, because it may have attacked that floor to some degree. You don't have to get a... You don't have to get a certification from a building inspector that the floor is okay. Just throw your tool in there once or twice, hit the floor. If the floor is good, you may hit a bed. You may hit a couch. Who knows what you might hit. You may come in on a desk. I mean, I'm sitting at a desk right now at a window. Somebody comes in that window, they're going to be on top of my desk, right? So feel it. Make sure you got something to land on when you get in there and get in. And I, and I think before we get inside there, uh, oh, by the way, before I forget, if anybody's interested in that little device John talked about that you that you kind of it bolts around your your Halligan hook, uh, get a hold of guys in Wichita, Kansas. They'll tell you it, it's it's a great way to marry your your Halligan to the tool. It also provides you, like John said, a step. You you sit that against there, and it gives you a step to get into a window if you need a step up. It's like a little mini, you know, peg to put your foot on. But but that 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 being said, you know. Um, you know whether whether you're going in or you're pushing or you're not or whatever um, that that clearing the window getting in there and I, I want to go not too far past John I want to interrupt you for just one second when you talked about it's going to light up you, we see this all the time you take the window and it lights up right away or you know it's coming you take the window like you said and some of these guys don't give it a chance they they take it and they go in I'm like no 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 I've always been a big one front you take the front door stop for a second. You take the back door, stop for a second, give it a chance, like you said, to breathe. It's going to tell you, we misread buildings and fire all the time. We misread right. the smoke. It's like, and and in some of it, you go, oh, you know what's coming next, right? You're watching, we watch the YouTube videos. You see it, you go, watch, watch, watch. And uh, like 60 seconds, it comes out and it either and keeps going. And it sometimes out. it's just the mixture coming out the window. Sometimes the flames are just outside the window. Inside, there is no fire. Obviously, it's hot enough to be on fire, right. you know, but it's a little too rich. Yeah. And as it vents out the window and mixes with the atmospheric air, it lights up. So you could end up with that as well. Right. And and then going in, like you said, you know, feeling the floor, pushing the floor, just like you would on an aerial ladder. You know, we always talk about this, how you reach over, swing, don't let go. You know, these guys, the impact load, we call it impact load. You get in there, you get in the parapet, and then you see them jump. But oof. You know, or they jump off the ladder, and you and I preach against that big time. You know, je- you, uh, that aerial ladder, just like you have it up over that parapet, that roof, where you can kind of grab your arm, swing over, and set yourself down. If something happened, you can pull yourself up. Right. Two ways with going in, if if we're the if we're the outside vent person, you know, just like we do for the Denver Rescue when I teach that, all right, you know, if you're going to go in on your belly, let's say you t- you're reaching and you're pushing, as you're if you're going to go in head first, you know that whole thing to climb in there. You and I have always taught it. We used to do it at, at, at Get Out Live and Save Your Own at FDIC. As you're going in, you take your your boots. You just you keep your legs spread in that window if you can. Most windows you can. As you slide in, you have the ability to stop yourself with your feet. We used to teach all the time when you're sliding, stop. You know, stop. Hold yourself for a second. You could actually be in there pushing or reaching or whatever. The other thing is if you're gonna if you're going to saddle it, right? If you're going, this is back to the aerial ladder tip, John. If you're going to, sit, you know, you take it, you kind of sit on the sill and you go in. This is the reason you don't jump in. This is the reason you don't right. go in at first, right? Because if for some reason you pushed with your tool and it wasn't enough to push through the floor, 
but now you put 150 pounds with an air pack on it, you haven't lost the windowsill yet. You can still grab or pull or whatever you have to do. So that Again, I always say it. The, the, we do this on a show all the time. You always bring up these sneaky points. You're, we talk about this so much. I'm like, no, no, wait, wait. That's a great point you brought up, and I don't want to pass that one up either. Right, so, right, um, right. So, getting in and doing our thing. What else? What else are we talking about with addressing windows, getting inside, or whatever? Well, one of the first things you want to do when you get inside, absolutely. One of the first things you want to do when you get inside. Now, this is. This is the second floor of a house. There's a fire on the first floor somewhere. It's hot and smoky where you're jumping in, which tells you what? The fact that you've entered a window and you got smoke coming out and you let it blow for a second tells you that the door to that room is open. That smoke didn't all come up through the floor or through the pipe traces. It, the, the door to the room is probably open up in the hallway on the second floor. So the first thing you want to do when you get into that room is penetrate, get to that door, and close the door and isolate that room so that the, the heat and the smoke and the gases from the fire downstairs – are not continuously coming in, especially, especially since you just vented the window and gave them a place to go. Now, now the fire knows there's, a, there's an opening there, and, and even more smoke and heat's going to be trying to come in there. So, get penetrate to that window. And I always, I always use an extreme example uh, when, when I tell that story, and I say, even if you were to encounter victim <clears throat> crawling across that that floor, you're in a bedroom, let's say, right? Even if you were to encounter victim. In the middle of the floor, I would still pass them by, get to the door, close it, and then come back and address the victim. And you're going to take you and, I, right. you and I have talked about this. There could be nine babies in bassinets screaming or in that room. You're going to crawl over them to isolate, to close the door. To close, It's all about door control. And you and I have talked about this. If we could post videos and pictures of, look at the hallway gutted. Look at the bedroom left is gutted. The bedroom on the right, it's like they're in there playing video games. You know, no smoke, nothing. The door was that's closed. how important that door is. Yeah, and once that's you close that door. door, once you close that door, you're in there with your SCBA, high heat condition, smoke condition. Once you close that door, your window is still open that you came in, right? You opened up a whole big opening, right? Now it's going to immediately start to lighten up for you, which is good too. Now, if you do have a either a complicated or a difficult, you find a 275 pound man on on the bed. Now you got to get him to the window, call for help, somebody come help you at the top of the ladder. It's all going to get done a lot better without searing heat pushing out the window above your head while you're trying to do it. Exactly, and and you and, and I was going to say this before, and, and again, you you just brought up now perfectly about once you close the door, whatever is in there for the most part is going to leave you that window, and and is in our job. We always talk about this. We 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 stretch initial tack line to get water on the fire. Are you and I. Uh, you and I both say our favorite thing to hear standing out in front of that building is water on the fire. God, I love that. I know how I you feel about down. that. Yep. All right. We, and we, we search for fire victims, but we ventilate to make the environment more tenable for for us and our fire tech, but 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 for potentially any of them. If they're laying in a bed or on the ground, you know, we want to get that off of them. We want to get that right. stuff off of them. Good, you know, good, timely, correct location ventilation is a life-saving activity. You're really improving the atmosphere inside for the, for the survivors that are still there that we haven't removed yet. Absolutely. So, you, you, again, you know, we, we talked about a lot of the tasks here. Everything from, and, and, and I do a little review because we have a couple more points to bring up, but we're on the way there and we're thinking, you should be already thinking. John and I mention this to our viewers all the time. The moment the tones come off, the moment, I mean, you should be thinking ahead of time. Like right now you have a coffee, you should be thinking about what if we caught a job and all that stuff. Don't get me wrong with that. But when the bells go off, you should be thinking, you know, if you're the driver, where am I going? Accessibility, what am I doing? Am I pumping? Am I not pumping? Am I really pumping? Am I set the ladder truck? We did our classes on placement. Why? And all that stuff, because you could screw up a fire ground big time if you don't place your rigs right. If you're if you're driving, what's your responsibility? If you're the officer, what do you think of size up and crew management and all that stuff? If you're riding here, if I'm the vent person, if I'm the search person, if I'm the nozzle man, whatever, and this OV position, if you think, and that's why I think, John, it is so important. I got to witness it, you know, personally in Louisville, Texas, great fire department. When we really went with an S, I call it the SOG, meaning, yeah, a lot of people do OV, but here's the SOG. This is the purpose, and here's all the tasks that need to be done. And when you train your people, John, when you train everybody in your department on those tasks, those tasks, whether conducted, how they're conducted, 
we haven't, we're going to talk about radio transmissions here in a second to command. Um, you know, I told people before that that's it. You, you know, I used to watch Gary and all of them, they get off the rig, Jeremy, gone. I mean, you don't have to say, you know, that's like you and I would talk managing a mayday. Uh, red team uh, ready to deploy. No, you hear a mayday, you better have, you better be, I should have to stop you from going in. You know, the, the, you're the RIT officer. You should be looking at me on your way and going, we're, we're there. You know, same thing with this. The OV gets off the rig, boom, gone. And like I said, if you don't want him or her to start doing their stuff, you better say, OV, hold off, hold off. We got it. We got it. It was a mattress on the second floor. Don't do nothing. Right. Just like I said, hold off. Don't cut a hole yet. You know, you call them. If you're, if you're trained and you and I talk about always staying on task, if you're a nozzleman, then you're not, you're a tack fifer. If you're a vent, if you're a search, if your job is the OV, stay on task. But your size up to command is huge. If you get to the back and you see toys, tell command, command, I got a bunch of toys in the backyard. Now he's going to tell them, start looking for kids. If I see a wheelchair ramp, I have someone who's either wheelchair bound or, you know, they're having a difficult time, you know, that kind of thing. You know, they're, they're not moving like, like you and I, all right. All those different things, wires down, uh, you know, the, the, I'm already looking at the pool, all the different things, exposures, fire, where the fire's at command. Uh, I got fired a second floor window now, or how about basement windows? You and I have done three sixties as an incident commander going around and everything looks good. And then your OV goes around the back says command from OV. I got heavy smoke pushing out, the, one of the basement with the well windows back here, which shouldn't be happening. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that changes your outlook as the incident commander dramatically. We're going, you know, especially when they can't find the fire kind of thing or they're looking for it. So, I mean, again, not you said this before, and I agree with you not to turn this into a 360 class, but oh my goodness, there are so many things that position can be covered by that firefighter, both interior and exterior. Very dynamic. Uh, yep. So, now, what I used to like hearing, John, on the radio is when you, if you're the OV and you're done, what I want to hear was one of a couple of things. Command, com, I used to get this, command from OV, mission accomplished. Some guys say command from OV, complete. You don't have to come all the way back. Tell me as soon as, you know what that means? That means that, that means that you got the back of the buildings open up. You didn't see anything that you need to tell me about. You know what I'm saying? You went, okay, I, I, I'm, a, I'm already knowing you went to the back. You didn't see any hazards I should know about as an commander. You didn't see any fire condition changes. I didn't see anything else. You know what? You took it. It's open. It's secure. If they get jammed up, I know I have a door that's open for them. It's vented done. Or you're going to, like, like you know, if you can't secure the power, a lot of places now, John, you know this, you have the little lock on the meter where you can at least shut it off from the pot. You can take your hand, you can bust that little lock and throw that breaker, at least shut it off from the meter inside. If you can't, you and I have had Andy Allison. We both love Andy Allison from Louisville, right? Uh, Calvin's son. Calvin's got some great boys that are firefighters, but Andy was on the job at Louisville. I hired him, and uh, he ended up at, right after I left, he got electrocuted and put him off the job. Horror. We've had him on the show, folks. And this is, anyway, um, you know, one of the things that was missed, if you remember Calvin when he was on our show, John, his dad was one, my union president there and a captain. He said, you know, you, you need to tell me, command from OV, mission accomplished, be advised, chief, power is still on, the building is still energized. Let me know. That means that you couldn't, some people pop meters in the rural areas because the power companies are delayed. Some people don't practice that. Some people, you know, some you have the drip lines, whatever. If you've got the newer, like on my house right here, I can I can bust the lock and I can pop the breaker on the outside that shuts the power off. You know, you need to tell me those things, you know. Um how about this, John? I, I'd want to hear this. You get around to the back of the building, command from OV, mission accomplished, chief, they're making good progress. I got, you know, meaning I'm seeing smoke conditions change. I'm seeing white smoke. I'm seeing steam. Tell me that. Don't right. waste an opportunity to give Chief Salka, your incident commander, a little tidbit that he's going, you know, I wish I had a drone. I wish I had some. Well, you, you're the drone. We got him now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got the drones now, but... You're the drone. Tell me. Don't, you know, I don't want a radio talk show. You and I don't like that. If you say something, make sure it's pertinent. Make sure it's something significant. You know, right. if you just say mission accomplished, I already know what you got done. Other than that, tell me something, you know, that I need to hear that's going to impact. Or give me a quick little, hey, chief, they're making great headway. I can hear, you know, how about this? You can hear water. They're in the room. I can hear water flow. It's hitting the windows or whatever. It's coming out. I got, you know. 
tell me, you know, so, so, you know, you, you, I know what's going on out front if that, if that's what's happening. So it's funny. We used to, uh, I remember back when I was in 11 truck, um, and, and other times in my career as well, uh, where you legends know, were made, where legends were made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you had a really <laughs> good guy in the OV, which you know often it was, sometimes their whole goal in life was to was to open the door for the forceful entry team, was to get around to the back, vent, get in there, and get to the door while the while the forceful <laughs> entry team was forcing the door. Well, so they open it from the inside, say, "Come on in," you know. And, and they, <laughs> that be careful. perfect. Yeah, yeah. That's. That's Curtis. That's Curtis. Remember, that's Curtis on the truck. Yep. Getting to the, when Pete Novi's yelling at him, they're first to it. We got a stretch line. No, we're bringing the can. You're, we're stretch line. No. He gets to the third floor of the apartment building on Woodward. I get there and he goes, Command, fire's knock, hold the line. He used to love that shit, hold the yeah, line stuff. Yeah, so yeah. I, I would love to go, Oh, how you doing? Uh, do you have my pizza? Okay, come on in. Fire's in the back. <laughs> well, Sum it up, John. Um, let, let's sum this up. Uh, let's put you back in the Bronx. Um, busy ass battalion, 18th battalion. Uh, tremendous companies. We always brag on your companies. Um, uh, you know, the, the, well, the FDNYs. You'll be the first one to say no fire department is perfect, but they. I always say they do a ton of shit right. You're the incident commander. Sum up the importance of the outside vent preserve, the OVM outside vent position to you, Chief Salka. It, it, uh, Sal Blooming Grove at your Valley Place or in the Bronx, sum up the importance of that position. You know, the OV, you know, I was in the Bronx, the OV was like a scout, you know, like, you, like you're sending one guy out there. In the case of the FDMY is too, because both trucks have an OV, right? But it's like a scout. It's like sending a, sending a scout out somewhere to, to, to check things out for you. And all of a sudden you get a report from the rear about stuff that's going on that you haven't seen yet or that what that wasn't there when you did look at the rear, maybe. Um, and they're also going to make they're going to penetrate the building for you. They're going to be able to make some rescues or give you some more interior information as well. It's like a lone guy out there that that makes that is a, a really uh, has the opportunity to have a really positive impact on the fire. Yep. Well, it's I like I said, it, th this is sometimes the deal breaker for you. This is the one that makes or breaks. I'll, I'll emphasize this again. I started by saying this. The impact of the OV is absolutely incredible on the fire ground. And sometimes that's the difference between making a good initial push or being beat and pushed out the door and not being able to get it. When you've got no relief, you open that door. If that's the only opening of the place, especially with thermal pains, now, it's going to want to come towards you. That OV getting around the back, you said it, the scout, the eyes, the ears, one person can dramatically change. This is Absolutely. one of those impact positions. Absolutely. Yep. Change for everything sure. for you. So, all right, buddy. Well, hey, um, and, and I'll, I'll apologize to our viewers right now. At the beginning of the show, if I was rambling and bumbling my words a little bit over my excitement of of, of being able to, to have, I, I, I just say it. I had Congratulations. Congratulations. Of leading, oh, leading some incredible men and women. They are just. The men and women that work there are phenomenal in Estes Valley. Um, hey, we sell T-shirts. Um, oh, God, my chief of staff, Erica, is going to hate me for that because we're going to get, like, Yeah, you're going to have to break, you're gonna have to break them in now. <laughs> <laughs> T-shirt sales. Um, you know you know me. The coffee pot's always on. If you're ever there, over 4 million people come there for vacation, stop by for a visit. I know the guys would love showing you their stuff. We're right there in the Rocky Mountains. We're, Station 2 is at the entrance to the Rocky Mountain National Park. Absolutely breathtaking. I'll say this. As breathtaking as the area is, the fire department's cooler. I'm just going to say it. The fire department's freaking awesome. I can't wait for you to meet him, John. Um, you're going to love him. Big Mike, Mike Scott, my brother from another mother. Big Mike's right, right close It'll by. Um, I can't wait to get there. Check it out. Oh. Five great directors. Like I said, the, the bo my bosses. And I have, you know, not only do I have the, the dream team with, with the, you know, the firefighters, the working class, I call it, the, the staff are, are absolutely incredible. So Estes Valley Fire Protection District, take a look. Um, John, if they want to get a hold of you for some information or a class or whatever, best email? Chief John Salka at gmail.com. I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. Soon to have a second email address again. Um, hey, Please sign up. If you're coming to FDIC, don't wait to sign up for our class because I always feel bad when people catch us in the hallway and go, I couldn't get in. They close the doors. Um, sign up for yeah, our workshop. Yeah, five yep. alarm. 
Excellent. Absolutely. We look forward to seeing you there. It's right around the corner. Um, don't forget, um, Fire Engineering has some incredible stuff. John and I have been with them for a long time. Uh, John writes for Firehouse as well. Um, you know, there's Fire Engineering Magazine. They have, well, I won't get it all, but they have, they have gems, the EMS, for us EMS professionals, Fire Apparatus, which is everything inside a firehouse, not just the rigs, it's tools, stations, everything. It's, it's a, it's an incredible, another incredible magazine. You've got FDI, you have firefighter nation, you've got the fire Academy, the training committee. There's so many things that, that, that you go to that masthead at the top of fireengineering.com where you're at now. Uh, you can get lost in there. It's pretty incredible. There's some great podcasts like this every night of the week that our producer Mark puts out there. Um, the hump day hangouts, John and I, along with our good buddy, Terry McGrath. Hey, congratulations to Chief Terry McGrath, retiring from Louisville as assistant chief and taking assistant chief with Tiffmist. We had them on our show, the big mutual aid group in Texas. We love Terry. Scott Thompson, author of the best-selling book, The Functional Company, <laughs> The Functional Fire Company. Um, it's a great group. And uh, I'll just end it with this, John. I, you know, we we miss and we love Bobby Halt. Chief Bobby Halt was incredible. His 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 XO as he called him, Chief David Rhodes and Diane Rothschild are doing, and their staff are doing phenomenal things. Uh, David is, he's just he's incredible. He I'm, is. I'm so he's happy great. he's my boss. He's great. Oh, he, I'm, I'm telling you, the ideas that guy has is actually kind of scary. His yep. mind, the way it works. Yep. Um, but that being said, um, you can catch us anytime. Check us out on social media. Um, go like Estes Valley Fire Protection District's Facebook page. In closing, John, I always ask you uh, to, to, to please do this. Please keep the men and women, our armed forces, and your thoughts and prayers. And remember this, never forgetting truly means that never forgetting. Be safe. God bless you. And we'll catch you next time. I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Exposure 4. That's the fire. Through the roof of the fire, though, you're the entire rear section. Now, remember, given the payday, as if it accounted for, okay? 610 that was the name, 610 I'm out here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. people on the front fire escape here with windows circuits below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary switches are underway. Breathing in diesel exhaust fumes is like walking into a fire without a mask. Over time, those toxins lead to cancer. Protect yourself with MagnaGrip the easiest, most reliable exhaust removal system that features a true 100% seal to eliminate diesel exhaust fumes. To get free grant assistance, visit magnagrip.com.